Testing one, two. Hi. <clears throat> Let's get you a little closer. I wonder if I should move you over here. There we go. It's a little bit better. Well, good evening. Hey everybody, how's it going? How is spooky season? Hey, San Francisco. Hey, everybody. It's uh, it's good to see all of you. It's been an interesting week. 
The air quality in Seattle is not good right now. Lots of forest fires. I've had to stay indoors. Oh, the way I look is intentional. Feels like a um, kind of a chill day. Yeah, I'm. It's it's strange. I'm live on a Monday. Go figure. How's my spooky season? It's going really well. It was a bit of a weird week last week. Um, some making some adjustments to the whole um, structure of how. Uh, where I put content and also strategizing on how I'm going to do content on TikTok and YouTube and other things for the future. Um, so yeah, although I did enjoy showing off a particular toy on Friday, that was fun. <laughs> Am I on Quinn? I am on Quinn. Yes. The handle is doing great. What's Quinn? Quinn is one of two platforms that I'm currently on at the moment uh, for audio, for audio experiences. Uh, you can find me on Quinn. You can also find me on Patreon. So, as I usually do, uh, for anyone who is just seeing me for the first time, um, I take requests. Read a, read a few poems, some stories, you know, hang out. Enjoy a little bit of audiogasmic experiences. So, let's drop in a little bit. Take a moment. Just breathe in the air around you. I hope you're wearing headphones because that will definitely make this experience more satisfying. <laughs> So I'm going to read a few requests and then, um, I thought just to celebrate the season, I'll read, uh, the Raven. <laughs> so the first request is, um, Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken, from Tigris Katie. So it goes like this. Is there some static?
How's the sound now? Any, uh, is it coming through clear? Testing one, two. Cool. Okay. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one travel lo traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages since. Hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Ninety-three percent Stardust by Nikita Gill. We have calcium in our bones, iron in our veins, carbon in our souls, and nitrogen in our brains. Ninety-three percent Stardust with souls made of flames. We are all just stars that have people names. What's the tea? It's a turmeric peppermint of some kind. Hello, my love. So it was about a year ago that I think I first started doing the weekly lives. Um, and I started with reading Edgar Allan Poe. Although the first live I ever did was reading Alice in Wonderland during the summer. And I just did one. And I think I don't even know how many uh, people were watching. One, 
once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Huh. Distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden who the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. That is it, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, "'or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore.' But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that scarce I was sure I heard you. Here I opened the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, Fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what there it is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. "'Tis the wind, and nothing more. "'Open here I flung the shutter, "'when many a flirt and flutter, "'in there stepped a stately raven "'of the saintly days of yore. "'Not the least obeisance made he, "'not a minute stopped or stayed he, "'but with mine of lord, of lady, "'perched above my chamber door, Perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, 
though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour, nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered. Till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Never more. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, the, what it utters is its only stock and store, Caught from a, some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster Followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, Till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore Of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, oh, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tuffled floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath quaff, O oh, quaff this kind Nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Respite, respite and Nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still of bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed he thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted. Tell me, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, thing of evil, said I, Prophet still, if bird or devil, By that heaven that bends above us, By that God we both adore, Tell this soul with sorrow laden, If within the distant Aden it shall clasp, a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, Bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting, Get thee back to the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave me a 
No, leave no black plume as a token of that lie that thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight over him is streaming, throws his shadows on the th floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the door shall be lifted nevermore. The Raven from Edgar Allan Poe. Thanks for listening, everyone. TMI of the day. See, our, our, our criteria for TMI is just getting more and more restrictive every time we ask this question. <laughs> I neglected to put on a belt today. <laughs> so if I stand up, my pants will fall down. Because I've lost a lot of weight in the past month. So nothing fits. The belt is being used for something else right now. I actually have gotten the corset. It just arrived. And the reveal is coming soon. to meet you. I'm a purveyor of audio experiences. If you like what you're listening to, uh, you can always tap here and go to my profile, click the link under my name, and, uh, you know, if you go to my Patreon, you will find a lot of longer form content, which is fun. Um, the entire range of experiences. Feel free to peruse.
So a um, <clears throat> couple of things that I am working on. I am going to be separating uh, the content that I do with Orcus Auditory on this account from some of the more meditative um, content that I've started posting more often, sort of the mental health based content. I'm going to be putting that into a separate TikTok account. So this one will be a little bit more playful, more shadowy. Uh, and that one will be more of the uplifting mental health based stuff. And I'll make an announcement of what it's going to be uh, shortly once I get everything figured out. Why not both here? Um, I will be doing some stuff here, just not as much as I was before. Um, the main reason is so that I can sort of streamline the audience of both platforms, both accounts. It might be separate lives. I don't know. We'll see how that, that hand is handled. Oh, the Halloween costume is going to be great. All right, I have a request from Amanda from the Comfort Book by Matt Haig. Resting is doing. You don't need to be busy. You don't need to justify your existence in terms of productivity. Rest is an essential part of survival. An essential part of us. An essential part of being the animals we are. When a dog lies in the sun, I imagine it does it without guilt. Because as far as I can tell, dogs seem more in tune with their own needs. As I grow older, I think that resting might actually be the main point of life. To sit down passively, inside or outside, and merely absorb things. The tick of a clock, a cloud passing by, the distant hum of traffic, a bird singing, can feel like an end in itself. It can actually feel and be more meaningful than a lot of the stuff we are conditioned to see as productive. Just as we need pauses between notes for music to sound good, and just as we need punctuation in a sentence for it to be coherent. We should see rest and reflection and passivity and even sitting on the sofa as an intrinsic and essential part of life that is needed for the whole to make sense. From the Comfort Book by Matt Hay. Do I have any Shell Silverstein? Random poem from Shel Silverstein. What's in the sack? What's in the sack? What's in the sack? Is it some mushrooms or is it the moon? Is it love letters or downy goose feathers? Or maybe the world's most enormous balloon? What's in the sack? 
That's all they asked me. Could it be popcorn or marbles or books? Is it two years' worth of your dirty laundry or the biggest old meatball that's ever been cooked? Does anyone ask me, hey, when is your birthday? Can you play Monopoly? Do you like beans? What is the capital of Yugoslavia? Or who embroidered that rose on your jeans? No, what's in the sack? That's all they care about. Is it a rock or a rolled-up giraffe? Is it pickles or nickels or busted bicycles? And if we guess it, will you give us half? Do they ask where I've been or how long I'll be staying, where I'll be going or when I'll be back? Or how do or what's new or hey, why are you blue? No, all they keep asking is what's in the sack. What's in the sack? I'm blowing my stack, and the next one who asks me what's in the sack... What? Oh, no, not you too. Here's the picture of the guy with the sack. Hades finale. Yes. Um, so I redid the vocals on it because I wasn't quite fully satisfied with the previous performance. Um, and now all I need to do are the sound effects and, uh, and that'll, that'll be quick. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be a good one. It's a longer one. So stay tuned. And I do break a little bit of ground with it try a few new things. Uh, for those who are curious, the next uh, um, spicy audio that I'll be releasing is um, set with Hades. From Julie, uh, The Sun Will Rise and So Will We, by Janae Cecilia. I know you are afraid to take that next step, but you have to move either way, so make it towards the direction you want to get. Yeah, I got a request for uh, Stephanie Breyer, um, but it looks like it's coming from a book that is not available online, so... And I don't own that one, unfortunately. No, you haven't missed Alice. Have not missed Alice. I will be reading another chapter shortly. Uh, this one's called Lamp or Mirror by Tony Barnstone. Request from Lisa. When strange light stirs the mirror, forces swirl. The shadows by the bathtub and I glimpse a figure standing 
glowing. As I rinse the toothpaste down the drain, his blind eye whirls numinous white. His hair is moonlight, streaming. I know neurologists have shown the course of dreaming as synaptic lines of force, and even in this dream I know I'm dreaming. Yet, when the light refracts at such an angle it shows his broken face, frost in his beard, his black lips mouthing words, I only hear as moaning of an operatic angel. His ice hand reaches out. I flinch in fear. The mirror breaks. I gasp awake. He's here. The next one uh, was uh, is a poem by Lonely Girl. I have mastered my beast, absolved my flaws, faced my demons, owned my life. Fight for myself every day. Do not overestimate my kindness, my gilded heart. I know my worth. Do you? Have I read spicy books on lives before? Uh, I've gotten in trouble for reading spicy books on lives before. I got banned for a week uh, for trying to read a spicy book. Oh, I almost got banned for a week. Uh, then they, they, uh, I fixed it with an appeal. And yes, I do do other lives elsewhere, a little bit more explicit. Not visually, uh, but auditorily. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. A poem by William Bortz called Reminders. Leave space in your mouth for rain, behind your ears for flowers, in your twilight for fire, in between your fingers for fingers in your hand, for tomorrow. I saw a request for Desiderata. Haven't read that one in a while. Desiderata, Words for Life.
Sammy, did I read it wrong? All right, I'll try again. Reminders. Leave space in your mouth for rain. Behind your ears for flowers. In your twilight for fire. In between your fingers for fingers. In your hands. For tomorrow. Okay, Desiderata by Max Ehrman. Go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others, even the dull and ignorant. They, too, have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexations to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may became, become vain and bitter, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself. Especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune. But do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be. And whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace with your soul, with all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams. It is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. Desiderata by Max Ehrman Let's see what we got.
what do you call a bear with no teeth? A gummy bear. And we'll just put the whole atmosphere in the toilet. (laughs) Uh, Why do nurses really love red crayons? Because sometimes they have to draw blood. All right. I have a request. The Witch's Chant from Macbeth by William Shakespeare. Hmm. I don't think I've read this one. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisons and trails throw, Toad that under a sto- cold stone Days and nights has thirty-one Sweated venom sleeping got Boil thou first in the charmed pot Double, double toil and trouble Fire burn and cauldron bubble Fillet of a fenny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing. For charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, which is mummy, ma, and gulf, of the raven, salt sea shark, root of hemlock digged in the dark, liver of blaspheming Jew, gall of goat, and slips of yew, silvered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk and Tartar's lips, finger of birth, strangled babe, ditch delivered by the drabe. Make the gruel thick and slab, add thereto a tiger's chaudron, for ingredients of our cauldron, double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble, by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way cru- comes. Oh, I like that last line. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. It's nothing to worry about. As long as you're here, you're safe. All you have to do is close your eyes and breathe into the moment.
doing such a great job, darling. How about some Alice in Wonderland? We're on Chapter 5, Advice from the Caterpillar. The Caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence. At last, the Caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and addressed her in a languid, sleepy voice. "'Who are you?' said the caterpillar. This was not an encouraging opening for a conversation, Alice replied rather shyly. "'I I hardly know, sir. Just at present, at least, I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then.' "'What do you mean by that?' said the caterpillar sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, said Alice, because I'm not myself, you see. I don't see, said the caterpillar. I'm afraid I can't put it more clearly, Alice replied very politely, for I can't understand it myself to begin with, and being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. "'It isn't,' said the caterpillar. "'Well, perhaps you haven't found it so yet,' said Alice. "'But when you have to turn into a chrysalis, you will some day, you know, "'and then after that into a butterfly, I should think you'll feel it a little queer, won't you?' "'Not a bit,' said the caterpillar. "'Well, perhaps your feeling may be different,' said Alice. "'All I know is—' "'It would feel very queer to me.' "'You!' said the caterpillar contemptuously. "'Who are you?' "'Which brought them back again to the beginning of the conversation. "'Alice felt a little irritated at the caterpillars making such very short remarks, "'and she drew herself up and said very gravely, "'I think you ought to tell me who you are first. "'Why?' said the caterpillar. Here was another puzzling question, and as Alice could not think of any good reason, and as the caterpillar seemed to be in a very unpleasant state of mind, she turned back. "'Come back!' the caterpillar called after her. "'I've something important to say!' This sounded promising. Certainly, Alice turned and came back again. "'Keep your temper!' said the caterpillar. "'Is that all?' said Alice, swallowing down her anger as well as she could. "'No,' said the caterpillar. Alice thought she might as well wait, as she had nothing else to do, and perhaps, after all, it might tell her something worth hearing. For some minutes it puffed away without speaking, but at last it unfolded its arms, took the hookah out of its mouth again, and said— "'So you think you're changed, do you?' "'I'm afraid I am, sir,' said Alice. "'I can't remember things as I used... "'I can't remember things as I used, "'and I don't keep the same size for ten minutes together.' "'Can't remember what things?' said the caterpillar. "'Well, I've tried to say, "'How doth the busy bee, but it all came different.' "'replied Alice in a very melancholy voice. "'Repeat, you are old, Father William,' said the caterpillar. "'Alice folded her hands and began. "'You are old, Father William,' the young man said, "'and your hair has become very white, "'and yet you incessantly stand on your head, 
Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain, but now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason of that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his grey locks, I kept all my limbs very supple by the use of this ointment, one shilling the box. Allow me to sell you a couple. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than sweet. Suet. Yet you finished the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife and the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. You were old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever, yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I've answered three questions, and that is enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off, or I'll kick you downstairs. "'That is not said right,' said the caterpillar. "'Not quite right, I'm afraid,' said Alice timidly. "'Some of the words have got altered.' "'It is wrong from beginning to end,' said the caterpillar decidedly, and there was silence for some minutes. The caterpillar was the first to speak. "'What size do you want it to be?' it asked. "'Oh!' "'I'm not particular as to size,' Alice re hastily replied. "'Only one doesn't like changing so often, you know.' "'I don't know,' said the caterpillar. Alice said nothing. She had never been so much contradicted in her life before, and she felt that she was losing her temper. "'Are you content now?' said the caterpillar. "'Well, I should like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind,' said Alice. Three inches is, su is such a wretched height to be.' "'It is a very good height indeed,' said the caterpillar angrily, rearing itself upright as it spoke. It was exactly three inches high. "'But I'm not used to it,' pleaded poor Alice in a piteous tone, and she thought to herself, "'I wish the creatures wouldn't be so easily offended.' "'You'll get used to it in time,' said the caterpillar, and it put the hookah into its mouth and began smoking again. This time Alice waited patiently until it chose to speak again. In a minute or two the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned once or twice and shook itself. Then it got down off the mushroom and crawled away in the grass, merely remarking as it went, "'One side will make you grow taller, and the other side—' will make you grow shorter. One side of what? The other side of what? thought Alice to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar, just as if she had asked it aloud, and in another moment was out of sight. Alice remained, looking thoughtfully at the mushroom for a minute, trying to make out which were the two sides of it. As it was perfectly round, she found this a very difficult position. However, at last she stretched her arms round it as far as they would go, and broke off a bit of the edge with each hand. "'And now which is which?' she said to herself, and nibbled a little of the right-hand bit to try the effect. The next moment she felt a violent blow underneath her chin— it had struck her foot. She was a good deal frightened by this very sudden change, but she felt there was no time to be lost, as she was shrinking rapidly, so she set to work at once to eat some of the other bit. Her chin was pressed so closely against her foot that there was hardly room to open her mouth, but she did it at last and managed to swallow a morsel of the left-hand bit. "'Come, my head's free at last!' said Alice in a tone of delight, which changed into alarm in another moment when she found that her shoulders were nowhere to be found. 
All she could see when she looked down was an immense length of neck, which seemed to rise like a stalk out of, out of a sea of green leaves that lay far below her. "'What can all that green stuff be?' said Alice. "'And where have my shoulders got to? And uh, my poor hands, how is it I can't see you?' She was moving them about as she spoke, but no result seemed to follow, except a little shaking among the distant green leaves. As there seemed to be no chance of getting her hands up to her head, she tried to get her head down to them, and was delighted to find that her neck could bend about as easily in any direction like a serpent. She had just succeeded in curving it down into a graceful zigzag, and was going to dive in among the leaves, which she found to be nothing but the tops of the trees under which she had been wandering, when a sharp hiss made her draw back in a hurry. A large pigeon had flown into her face. and was beating her violently with its wings. "'Serpent!' screamed the pigeon. "'I'm not a serpent,' said Alice indignantly. "'Leave me alone.' "'Serpent, I say again,' repeated the pigeon in a more subdued tone, and added with a very kind of sob, "'I've tried every way, and nothing seems to suit them.' "'I haven't the least idea what you're talking about,' said Alice." "'I've tried the roots of trees, I've tried banks, I've tried hedges,' the pigeon went on without attending to her. "'But those serpents, there's no pleasing them!' Alice was more and more puzzled, but she thought there was no use in saying anything more till the pigeon had finished. "'As if it wasn't trouble enough hatching the eggs,' said the pigeon. "'But I must be on the lookout for serpents night and day. Why, I haven't had a wink of sleep these three weeks!' "'I'm very sorry you've been annoyed,' said Alice, who was beginning to see its meaning. "'And just as I'd taken the highest tree in the wood,' continued the pigeon, raising its voice to a shriek, "'and just as I was thinking I should be free of them at last, they must needs come wriggling from the sky. Ah, <sighs> Serpent!' "'But I'm not a serpent, I tell you,' said Alice. "'I'm a—I'm a—well, what are you?' said the per pigeon." I can see you're trying to invent something. I, I'm a little girl, said Alice, rather doubtfully, as she remembered the number of changes she had gone through that day. A likely story indeed, said the pigeon in a tone of the deepest contempt. I've seen a good many little girls in my time, but never one with such a neck as that. No, no, you're a serpent, and there's no use denying it. I suppose you'll be telling me next that you never tasted an egg. I have tasted eggs, certainly, said Alice, who was a very truthful child. But little girls eat eggs quite as much as serpents do, you know. I don't believe it, said the pigeon. But if they do, why then they're a kind of serpent, that's all I can say. This was such a new idea to Alice that she was quite silent for a minute or two, which gave the pigeon the opportunity of adding, "'You're looking for eggs. I know that well enough. And what does it matter to me whether you're a little girl or a serpent?' "'It matters a good deal to me,' said Alice hastily. "'But I'm not looking for eggs as it happens, and if I was I wouldn't want yours. I don't like them raw.' "'Well, be off, then,' said the pigeon in a sulky tone." as it settled down again into its nest. Alice crouched down among the trees as well as she could, for her neck kept getting entangled among the branches, and every now and then she had to stop and untwist it. After a while she remembered that she still held the pieces of mushroom in her hands, and she set to work very carefully, nibbling first at one, then at the other, and growing sometimes taller and sometimes shorter, until she had succeeded in bringing herself down to her usual height. It was so long since she had been anything near the right size that it felt quite strange at first, but she got used to it in a few minutes and began talking to herself as usual. Come! There's half my plan done now. How puzzling all these changes are! I'm never sure at what I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got back to my right size. 
The next thing is to get into that beautiful garden. How is that to be done, I wonder? As she said this, she came suddenly upon an open place, with a little house in it about four feet high. Whoever lives there, thought Alice, it'll never do to come upon them this size. Why, I should frighten them out of their wits. So she began nibbling at the right-hand bit again, and did not venture to go near the house till she had brought herself down to nine inches high. And that's the end of chapter five. Thank you. What was in the hookah? Good question. Probably some form of hashish. All right. A request from Twelfth Night. William Shakespeare. Oh, mistress mine, where are you roaming? Oh, stay and hear your true love's coming that can sing both high and low. Trip no further, pretty sweeting. Journeys end in lovers' meeting, every wise man's son doth know. What is love? Tis not hereafter, present mirth hath present laughter. What's to come is still unsure, in delay there lies no plenty. Then come kiss me, sweet and twenty. Youth's a stuff will not endure. This next one should be fun. By Nikita Gill, Difficult Damsels. Not all girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. Ah, these are girls. Made of dark lace and witchcraft and a little bit of vice. These are daughters made claw first and story mad, tiger roar and wolf bad. These are women made of terrible tempests and savage storms and the untamed, unwanted. These are damsels made of flawless fearlessness, made of more bravery than knights have ever seen. These are princesses made of valor and poison alike. And they are here to hold court as your queen.
All right, I think that's going to become a TikTok. I like that one. All right. I saw a request that I might see if I can do. All right, I have somebody requesting The Claiming of Sleeping Beauty, but that is a book. And if there's a particular passage you would like me to read, uh, feel free to send it to me. All right. Request as the sounds of silence by Simon and Garfunkel. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk to you again. Because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping. And the vision that was planted in my brain still remains with a sound of silence. In restless dreams I walked alone, narrow streets of cobblestone, neath the halo of a street lamp, I turned my collar to the cold and damp, when my eyes were stabbed by the flash of a neon light that split the night, and touched the sound of silence. And in the naked light I saw ten thousand people, maybe more, people talking without speaking, people hearing without listening, people writing songs that voices never share. And no one dared disturb the sound of silence. Fools, said I, you do not know silence like a cancer grows. Hear my words that I might teach you. Take my arms that I might reach you. But my words, like silent raindrops, fell and echoed in the wells of silence. And the people bowed and prayed to the neon god they made. And the sign flashed out its warning 
and the words that it was forming. And the sign said, The words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and tenement halls and whispered in the sounds of silence. It's one of my favorite songs, actually. Everyone wants to be someone's son, to light up someone's life, but why not be someone's moon to brighten it in the darkest hour? Hmm. Uh, another request by Morgan Harper Nichols. The request by S.R. Hazard from Morgan Harper Nichols. It's called For the Ladies. This was too good not to share. I know you desire to know love. But I just hope you know that you don't have to wait around for it. I just hope you know you don't have to wait to be noticed or chosen by beautiful shining through you. People who see you for who you truly are, and there will also be people who are too busy or preoccupied or just don't have the time. But their lack of ability to see you is not a reflection of you or your worth. The state they are in will not hinder you from being led where you need to be, no matter how well you know them or how connected you feel to them. You will still bloom in the way you were meant to, no matter who does or does not notice you. All right. Jamie and Claire's Blood Vow. I saw this as a request. Ye are blood of my blood and bone of my bone. I give ye my body that we too might be one. I give ye my spirit till our life shall be done. (sighs) 
Well, I'm not going to have time to get through all of the requests from the island, unfortunately. <clears throat> so, um, feel free to re-request them for next time. In the meantime, I want to thank you all so much for joining me. This is, uh, these are always really fun for me. <clears throat> And yeah, uh, for those of you just, you know, dropping in, I do these every Monday, um, every Monday at three thirty Pacific time. Um, every first Monday of the month, I do what's known as a red light live where we read, you know, a few more spicy requests. Um, and, um, you know, the rest of the time, the rest of the month, we're, we'll be reading more, you know, spooky material. So for the Islanders, next week, uh, when I open the request thread, I'm going to be looking for more spooky material to read. So, you know, find, let's, let's find some, some scary stuff. Hmm? Stuff that's not going to get me kicked off of TikTok, though, please. <laughs> and yeah, I'm always a fan of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm challenging you to find me something different than Poe. <laughs> All right, my love. I hope you have a lovely evening filled with tingles and electricity all through your body.